This video is brought to you by Keeps. What's up, guys? Michael here to talk about the only family sitcom to frequently feature Brian Cranston having his body hair shaved, Malcolm in the Middle. Today, we're here to ask, why is the show so good and why didn't we see more shows like it? We'll explain in this Wise Greg edition on Malcolm in the Middle. But before we continue, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that makes it easier and more affordable for men to treat their hair loss. The way you dress and the way you style your hair may be the best way that you express yourself. So it totally makes sense that you would be nervous to lose your hair. The good news is that prevention is key, so you can keep your hair with the right plan. You will have a consultation with a Keeps doctor, and from there, you will be able to get FDA-approved prescription or over-the-counter medication shipped to your home. It will arrive every three months, and it makes life so easy. You'll have access to ask your Keeps doctor any questions, and you'll be able to keep up to date with your progress. So find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and why hundreds of thousands of men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention. Go to keeps.com slash wisecrack or click the link in the description to get 50% off your first order. That is K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. Let's start by really examining what Malcolm in the Middle was doing because it was definitely something of an outsider for its time. On a superficial level, it was a single camera show, meaning it wasn't filmed in front of an audience on a studio set and it blessedly didn't have a laugh track. <laughs> This already situated it in the realm of not your typical family sitcom. And while it wasn't the first show to break the fourth wall, i.e. acknowledge the presence of the audience, it employed the device consistently. Wow. Usually we don't get someone storming off from the table until after pancakes. And long before it became something of a trope. Can you believe this guy? But most notably, it stands out as one of the few shows that took a realistic look at American life for the lower middle or working class. The very real economic stressors of raising four and then five kids in a working class family are ever present in the show's plot lines. There are the Epicurean ramifications of Lois losing her job. It's been 10 days since mom lost her job. Yesterday for dinner, we had macaroni and rice. Or the grievances the boys have with their student barber. Then we head over to the barber college. Why can't we go to a real barber? Because I like to support education. Besides, it's free. As sometimes the family is canceling a summer vacation to pay for Malcolm's medical bills. Well, there goes our summer vacation. Sometimes Malcolm's being accepted at Harvard only to learn he'll have to work as a janitor to pay his Ivy League tuition. In all cases, though, the threat of financial devastation looms large over the family and the entire series in a way that you rarely saw on primetime television. Three or four. Three or four. Hun this is perhaps best encapsulated by the final line of the theme song. Life is unfair. If this struck you as unusual when you were watching the series, that's because it was. In scholar Richard Bush's study of 262 so-called domestic situation comedies from 1946 to 1990 at least, he found that just 11% featured heads of household who were working class, i.e. doing blue collar, clerical, or service work. Malcolm's father, and future drug lord as you may remember, placed a low level clerical worker. This is despite the fact that most American workers qualify as working class. Back in 1976, scholars Gerbner and Gross addressed this still relevant trend, calling the exclusion of working class families from television a symbolic annihilation of America's economic realities. The problem is especially bad on children's television, where a scant 2% of characters are depicted as working class. Now, this isn't exactly a coincidence. Showing stable middle and upper class families is good for business, especially if you're making a family-friendly sitcom. And the reason is simple commercials. According to scholars Zieglinda Lemke and Wibke Schneiderman, as a form of mass entertainment financed by selling commercials to middle class consumers, it seems logical that the predominant mode of representing class presupposes middle class normativity. That is to say, watching the kids' skins stick to the seat in a rundown car with a broken radiator doesn't exactly put you in the mood to splurge on that cool new vacuum cleaner or a fancy bottle of cologne. In comparison, watching the Huxtables hang out in their brownstone while modeling yet another sick sweater from a seemingly endless pile brings viewers a sense of economic plenty that they might not feel in their day-to-day -day lives. Now, obviously, Malcolm the Middle wasn't the first show to peddle in economic angst. I'll tell you what they're going to pay you. They're going to pay you what all jobs pay. Less than you're worth and just enough to keep you crawling back for more. We saw this as far back as the 50s with the Honeymooners, while the mid-70s brought Laverne and Shirley, and the late 80s saw the debut of America's most famous working-class family on Roseanne. But for anyone with enough business savvy, it just didn't seem financially smart to make a family or children's show about bringing your leftover egg breakfast to school for lunch. What do you have? 
leftover eggs from breakfast. Which brings us to Disney, in a moment that is. First, we have to look at 1980, when a broad cultural phenomenon began, the Reagan-era loosening of restrictions on entertainment regulations, including advertising during children's television programming. Now, after a major 70s era crackdown on advertising to kids, you could only show a limited amount of commercials during children's programming and were also required to produce educational and informative content for kids. When President Reagan and co. had essentially signed or vetoed all that away by 1984, things changed rapidly. A year after regulation, all of the top 10 best-selling toys had their own TV show. While child-centric product placement had occurred during television's early days, that was really no comparison to this new reality. The insane proliferation of TV character-aligned merchandising was dubbed the Strawberry Shortcake Strategy by Tom Engelhart. That's thanks to the 1980s show's explosions of licensed dolls, video games, stickers, lunchboxes, and so on. And that reliance on branding would continue to increase from the 90s and on as corporations realized what a valuable consumer consumer demographic children could be. And though a 1990 congressional bill had reinstated some restrictions on such advertising, the industry had been changed forever. Increasingly, merchandising centered on children's television characters began blurring the line between consuming entertainment and just plain consumerism. And we're not trying to demonize your favorite Lizzie McGuire lunchbox. It's just a little weird. Which is why families like Malcolm in the Middle aren't the norm for places like the Disney Channel. While they didn't start making original live-action shows until the late 90s, they came in hard, quickly crafting what journalists Julia Boriston and Alinda Wheat call a tween machine, in which pre-teenagers, and in this case, primarily girls, were targeted through lifestyle marketing like the world had never seen. As scholar Morgan Genevieve Blue notes, the marketing was part and parcel with the programming decisions themselves, explaining that Disney Channel personnel worked closely with Disney Consumer Products and Disney Music Group to extend the network's fictional narratives across a variety of media and merchandise for tween girls. This was in order to effectively creep into the lives and life spaces of kids beyond the TV network. And that's according to a presentation given by President and CCO of Disney-branded television, Gary Marsh himself. And the way they did it? Mostly through appeals to girl consumers. As Blue explains, characters like Hannah Montana promote representations of aspirational celebrity and teen life via fact fashion and dress up and musical performances. And this way, according to Blue, franchisable girl star persona both reflects and perpetuates a neoliberal turn in the United States, which privileges a performative and celebrity oriented form of girlhood as the contemporary ideal, i.e. a girl who has all the products she needs to look and behave a certain way. In the aughts, this often took the form of sparkly clothes, as best seen in Disney's unprecedentedly large expansion into Walmart stores with clothing and lifestyle lines specifically marketed to middle and working class girls. By 2014, Disney was racking in $3.99 billion of revenue in consumer products alone, driven largely by Disney Channel merchandise. The franchise element of the Disney Channel explains why programmers need to make shows about securely middle class families. Doing so both doesn't alienate working class viewers, while also painting a fantasy of magical middle classdom where money is never a problem and consumption is a high priority. That is to say, the family on Wizards of Waverly Place may run a humble sandwich shop, but their apartment sure doesn't look that way. As Blue puts it, Disney's texts, products, and promotions may allay anxieties over vast systematic inequalities, in large part by painting an image of a world where families aren't struggling to make ends meet. This, of course, requires ignoring realities, like the fact that 14.4% of American children were growing up below the poverty line as of 2019. I actually am worried about the future because I just want us to be good and don't have to worry about how we're going to get the next thing or how we're going to get food. Of course, it's not just Disney and it's not just tween girls being targeted. Cartoon shows like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and The Smurfs were extended through a huge amount of licensed merchandising tie-ins, ranging from films to comics and books to computer games. Scholar Marsha Kinder observed back in 1991 that this transmedia intertextuality effectively eliminates any distinction between the original text, i.e. the show, and the spin-off text and commodities that bank on the show's success, which may be a large reason why children's and families television typically finds its comfort zone in middle to upper middle class bliss, where the biggest problem is your family photo shoot coming out squeaky clean. And there's nothing wrong with that. We love these shows, but it does present a skewed perspective of what American life is like. As Stile Sakira and Larry Osimensa put it, television serves as a tool that continues to mold the public consciousness, in part by fostering a single-minded interpretation of superficial symbolism as an indicator of status and quality. That is to say, by 
basically suggesting that the right house, the right toy, or the right sparkly outfit can bring you happiness and cement your status as happily middle class, TV reinforces a materialistic status quo. No, 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 I'm, I'm not gonna use this opportunity to sell you on more wisecrack swag. Which, which you can order by going to wisecrack.co. That's wisecrack.co. All of which brings us back to Malcolm in the Middle. While the show may have inspired its fair share of t-shirts, fan-made Lego sets, and my lifelong dream of getting a wood chipper, the series is pretty clearly not painting an aspirational portrait of class or consumerism in America. I want one eight by 10 and two wallet size for $9.99. In fact, it's often showing how harmful this culture can be by examining Malcolm's insecurities about his own class status. In this way, it's addressing a much grimmer reality, one that millions of American children experience off screen. And that's what makes it so unique and refreshing. Rather than selling an image of an American economy where raising four or five kids on working class wages as possible, it addresses the giant elephant in the TV room. But what do you guys think? Are we being too hard on Disney Channel's empire of sparkly shirts? Or does the world need a lot more shows like Malcolm in the Middle so that people can actually see the realities of their lives on screen? We just have to hold on a little bit longer. Let us know in the comments or make a dope reaction video to yell at us. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Gloss over that subscribe button like you're painting a Disney-friendly image of middle class in America, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.